Okay, recording now. Hello, everybody. Uh, today you got uh, Jeff Hajek and myself, Tim McMahon, here to talk about uh, ten random tips to help you supercharge you uh, on your journey um, for uh, continuous improvement in lean manufacturing in the true north. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some advice that we have uh, kind of experienced. You know, I know uh, in my own uh, experience, you know, there's been a lot of teachers that have given me advice along the way, and I think uh, learning some of those lessons, um, both from the pros and cons of those things and, and being able to evaluate those is beneficial. We all know there's no silver bullet, um, so sometimes it is beneficial to have these things um, uh, um, in some format that you can digest and you know, consider whether these are things that can help you on your journey. We do know that you know lean is really about applying that constant gentle pressure and that you know through the course of your um, journey on lean manufacturing you're going to find that um, you have ebbs and valleys of your, uh, of your process and uh, that's one of the reasons why you need that constant gentle pressure. So. You yes. share a little bit uh, about uh, some things that we've learned uh, along the way. So this is kind of a, an obvious uh, one uh, that I think um, you know we kind of say you know go to the Gemba, but I think you know there's a lot more to it than uh, just going to the Gemba. Gemba stands for the actual place, the actual condition. Um, it's where the work is done. Uh, it's a place where we see the value is added, um, and we want to observe that firsthand um, and be able to really understand our process. It may require collecting data, uh, talking with people. And what I find, at least in my experience, is that um, if you're new or maybe even uh, some more experienced people, they don't necessarily know what to do when they get there. What are they supposed to do? And so I think there's three uh, simple questions that you can ask. And that is, um, what is the process? What are you actually? What is the intent of the process that you're looking at? Uh, is it to make an item? Is it to process an order? Is it uh, to give a piece of paper uh, to somebody to follow up on? Um, then how can you tell that the process is working? It's really important to uh, understand what the output is and relate that in terms of what the customer value is. Um, and then how are you uh, doing towards improving it? We want that culture of continuous improvement that we're looking at this journey. And so you've got to constantly be looking, you know, what is the process, what's it telling me for the output, and how do I make an improvements in it? Um, and that's one way that you'll understand if that process is working. So this gives us the ability to um, look at our process with a new set of eyes, you know, a new set of lenses to um, critique our process. We become very familiar with our own uh, surroundings. And without having this framework of going to the process with specific things to look for, uh, we sometimes can't see the waste that's right in front of us. Yeah, it's interesting. This is one of those big ones that people always say. You know, it's the go to Gemba, go to Gemba, go to Gemba. And it's amazing how many times you'll be sitting in a project. You know, you're working on a project and you're sitting in a conference room and people start debating something that they could go and find out very, very simply by both walking down to where the work is done. So it's not just about learning about the workflow, it's about when you're actually improving it. If you have any questions, just go down there and look. And it's it's probably, you know, this is, this is the first tip here, and this is one of the biggest ones. If you have any questions, if there's ever even like an ounce of debate, walk down to where the work is being done and take a look. And, and you'll get loads of information that you can never get by talking about a process. And the, and the other point is the whole idea of using these Japanese terms like Gemba, there's some terms that make sense to use and some that don't. Um, you know, a, a lot of it, when you, when you treat lean as something unusual or foreign, it alienates people a little bit. So I try not to use too many of uh, the, the terms like this, but Gemba is just a very concise word, and it has, a, it has a lot of buried meaning, like Tim was saying. It's the actual place, actual process, where the work is actually being done at the actual time. It's a lot of the actuals, you know, the three reels, what they say. And it just takes so much longer to say, go down to the actual workplace where the actual work is happening at the actual time the work is going on. Or you can say, go to Gemba. And it's just a lot easier. So in this case, it makes sense. But you know, be, it's, it's not an actual tip here, but use the, the Japanese term sparingly when it makes sense to do it in line with your culture. Yeah, I think it's important to note that this isn't management by walking around either. You know, 
what is important is looking at the process view of things and the interaction with the people making the product and understanding um, that. It's not just uh, walking around and showing your authority or uh, just being in the place so that people say, can say, yeah, and the manager came to the floor. And it's really about the, that's where the value is created, so that's why you want to be uh, getting that first-hand knowledge about what's really occurring. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And when, when you're down there talking to people, it's not just about listening to what they're saying. You have to watch what's really happening, what, what their real feelings are. And, and there's a lot of psychology behind this. But let's imagine somebody comes up to you and says, I'm on board with the changes. This could be one of two people saying it. It could be the person on the right who looks happy or the person on the left who looks a little bit worried. And in one case, the words match, and in one case, the words don't. I don't have to tell you with these icons which words match which face. But in real life, it's a little bit more subtle. When you walk up to somebody and they're talking to you about changes, they're talking to you about processes, they're talking about things that are going on, it's not just listening to the words. It's really watching and trying to get that full understanding. And some of the basic tells that people have is, you know, there's, <clears throat> well, I think, you know, if people clear their throats or if they kind of look away for a second before they answer or if they don't make good eye contact, those are all indications of nervousness and that they're not really... Um, fully committed and that there's something else going on with what they're saying. Um, you know, the, the crossed arms or the, if the body's turned away or people kind of lean back in their chairs, these are all signs of defensiveness and resistance. Um, you know, a lot of these little tells are out there, and as you start watching for them, you'll see. I just did a little uh, consulting engagement a little while ago, and it was actually pretty funny because I was talking about speaking in negatives, and it's another thing that you kind of listen for. So if a person says, I'm on board with the changes, it's a pretty good indicator that they're actually on board. But if they say, I'm not against this, it's, it's a different way of saying it, but it has that negative word in it, the not, you know, I'm not against this, instead of I'm with it. And it, it's very telling that there's actually an underlying message in that. And I was telling somebody about this, speaking in negatives like this, this was an HR person, and uh, not 10 seconds later, the words coming out of her mouth were exactly like that with the, the speaking negatives. And we all had a good laugh about that. But, you know, it's the idea is don't just take everything at face value. Really dive deep into what people are saying and put a lot of that, uh, you know, your your inner psychologist to work. Yeah, a technique I use a lot, you know, is uh, asking the question and having them, you know, repeat that, you know, clarifying, you know, that they're really on board. Um, we all know actions speak a lot of the words, but... You know, and that's why you kind of study the body language. Um, but, you know, the follow-up dialogue is, is really critical. Yeah, that's, that's actually the piece that, you know, identifying it is, is easy part. What Tim is talking about is the hard part. It's actually going through and doing something about it. So if you hear somebody say these things, yeah, obviously you don't just walk away. You know, the person on the left, when they say, I'm on board with the changes, and you sense that, you know, you get those visual indicators, you do something with that. You ask them further questions. You try and, you know, you recognize that, the team is not as committed. So with these two people, one person I would trust to really be committed and take, you know, the banner and carry it forward. The other person, I wouldn't expect them to be a, an advocate to their to their teammates, and I wouldn't put them in a position where they have to, um, where I rely on them to spread the change until I do something else. So this person on the left is not is definitely not somebody that is going to carry the banner of lean forward for you. The person on the right might be. So the idea is do something more with it, and you want to build that team up. And, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with either of these people. It's just a matter of, you know, the human nature and what their personal needs and desires and everything is. And it doesn't match with what information you've given them so far. So you got to give them better information, and you got to help them make sure they get something out of all the changes that you're making. So as Jeff was saying, you, you do this because it leads into developing people, and I think that's one of the... Um, most important aspects of lean that's kind of often uh, underutilized, under under uh, understood, I guess. Um, so uh, this is the lever that allows you to control the speed at which you change. It's you know they're the uh, the manpower, the engine uh, that fuels your continuous improvement. So you, you do want to create a, you know, a culture that uh, works on teamwork, uh, always looks for the opportunity to make something better. It's constantly learning from another number of various sources. 
this will kind of highlight throughout this. Um, but it's important to, to build that knowledge, to solve problems, to be problem solving thinkers, uh, understand what countermeasures you can apply. You know, you get this toolkit, you know, but without having people who know how to identify a problem, apply the right uh, countermeasure to that, um, you won't be able to go as far as you'd like to. Um, and of course, there's always new challenges. There's always new uh, ways of solving problems. Uh, there's not always necessarily one answer to solve a problem. And that's why you need to be on this continuous learning, just like you're on this continuous improvement journey. They kind of go hand in hand there. Um, but you also have to understand that you know you will make mistakes. You got to be in an uh, environment that allows you to experiment, be able to take those calculated risks, and uh, you know when you make mistakes, you learn from those, and you make future improvements. Uh, you certainly don't want to uh, stamp out the creativity of the, the people within your organization. And of course, you know uh, if you're going to kind of allow some of this risk taking and experimentation. You have to trust that in the training that you give that people will then go try to apply uh, the right things. And you do have to get some sort of uh, levity to do that within uh, reason. And that will allow you to build trust and then that will continue to develop your people. And it's kind of this uh, continuous improvement cycle of learning that uh, feeds that continuous improvement uh, within your business. It, I recently wrote an article and basically what I said in the article was anytime you have an approval process you can think of it as a management failure, and it ties right into this. You know, if, if you develop your people, it makes your managers, the, a manager's and a leader's job much easier, right? You know, because this, this bottom one is the key one here, is people only do the right thing if you develop them and teach them and show them what the right thing is, and, you, you know, you constantly, you know, cultivate those skills. And when that happens, you know, people get empowered with the... Uh, you know, that extra responsibility. Not everybody does. Not everybody thrives on that extra responsibility. But if you can create a situation where you can give people as much responsibility as they want and as they feel comfortable taking as they're, as they're able to handle, people are much more satisfied. But managers' jobs get easy. They get much easier if you're not having to go and oversee teams on fundamental basic decisions. So I, I think this one, it goes much deeper than just giving satisfaction to the team. It actually makes the, the company run more smoothly. And from a personal standpoint, it makes managers more successful. Yeah, I think we find that uh, products and services are easy to think in terms of flow, but knowledge and learning and information may be a little bit harder for us to understand flow. And certainly your article highlights that, you know, uh, management approval as a gate, it stops the flow. So um, that kind of uh, understandably uh, shows that uh, you haven't gone far enough in developing your people, and it's an opportunity for improvement there. Absolutely. Now, the developing people is part of it, but the other part is motivating people. And there's a lot of big motivations that people have in their jobs. You know, they have their salary, they have overtime. Those are basically, you know, the the core motivators that get people to come to work every day. But people also have their in, you know, their inner intrinsic motivation, the stuff that comes from. You know, I, I was brought up to do a good job and to value a hard day's work and all that. But in, in changing small little behaviors, you need little instant rewards. And a lot of this comes in, in Kaizen activity or continuous improvement activity. You're asking people to do something different out of the ordinary when you're putting on a Kaizen team, say. You know, they're not being able to get their own work done, you know, their day-to-day -day work. And, and the Kaizen is actually their own work. I, I like to make sure there's not a distinction that it's extra work, it's you know part of their job, but it's like Tim was talking about, it breaks up the flow of the day-to-day -day routine. So there's things like free lunches, and it doesn't have to be a big spread like this. It could be a um, you know a basic lunch ticket for your cafeteria, or you could cater in sandwiches or whatever you do. But you know people feel taken care of when they get a little bit extra. So if you're taking them out of their job, putting them in a unusual situation where they're sitting in a classroom all day, it's not something that you know they're they're using different mental muscles and things like that. So, you know, the free lunch is a nice reward. It could be even easy things like, you know, a parking space or a credit in a company store. But um, I like to tell this little story here. And if you can get creative, you can find great high payoff rewards. And I worked um, for a couple of years, I worked in a, in a facility that used to be a soundstage for an old TV show called Northern Exposure. And because it was 
a sound stage, it was all fenced off in the parking lot, everything was closed and had limited access to get people in and out. And that might work fine in a, uh, a production, like a TV production environment where people are constantly coming and going. But when you're doing shift work with one gate in a, in a factory and, you know, 150 people are released when the, when the evening buzzer goes off, you know, the afternoon buzzer goes off and they all rush out to their cars, it could take a lot of time to get out of the parking lot. And I live in the Seattle area and the highways right around 4 o'clock just get packed. And, you know, at 4 o'clock the, the volume builds and by 4.15, you're sitting in gridlock to get across some of the bridges. So if I could get people out of the door five minutes early, they could get first out of the parking lot, get onto the highway, and be halfway across the bridge by the time the, the traffic's building. So that five minutes early could save them like half an hour of, of time in traffic. So it's highly valued to do that. So what I did is I just put a time bank up on the wall, and I just ticked it down as uh, people were late from meetings and breaks and things like that. We said we have to be somewhere. The time started ticking down, and the team policed themselves. There's this reward, and you, know, you find that little thing that drives people, and you can make some really great gains with that. And, of course, there's always the, uh, the old standby for um, any type of Kaizen activity. You know, Kaizen is fueled by donuts, and it's just you know, one of the basic things. So, Tim, any thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, another important one uh, certainly is the recognition, you know, uh, that that generally does not cost anything either, but it's the process of kind of recognizing the improvement that's being done. You know, anything from walls of fame to uh, letters home, you know, I've seen that too where managers send a letter home, uh, I think they employ for any improvement. So, I mean, you, you can be creative, you know, I think uh, food's always a good motivator and then certainly people obviously rationalize their own time getting leave early. But, you know, how do you recognize them in the company as well as maybe outside the company to their family and say that they did a good job? Those go a long way as well as um, um, to making sure that you're building that continuous. I want to do more of that culture. You know, I know if you heard the, the, the slapping sound, it was me smacking my forehead thinking, how did I leave that one off? You know, it's, uh, you know, I wrote my book about that, you know, the whole idea of creating satisfaction and giving rewards. So thank you very much for adding that it went in there. You know, and it's not just when there's, you know, a Kaizen activity or process improvement. That's just the day-to-day -day stuff. So, you know, when you hear somebody take care of a customer in an exceptional way, that uh, pat on the back goes a long way. And, you know, even better, if you do it on an email, you know, you send a little email record of like, hey, great job today with the, the Smith account, or, you know, I saw the way you handled that, and you send that little record. Sometimes people like to share that with their spouse. Hey, my boss recognized me today. You know, this... It, it's surprising how much that little pat on the back really helps people, isn't it? And along the same lines, you know, uh, Jeff and I talk a lot about this on our webinars uh, throughout the last uh, several uh, months. Is that small win, the small victory? You know, we'd all like to have that, you know, huge improvement. You know, but. There's not as many million-dollar opportunities out there, especially uh, depending on the size and, and, and of your business, whether it's a very large corporation or even a small uh, corporation. Um, but you know, you want to develop the continuous part of your journey and make it an everyday habit. So the small, frequent wins is really what we're after. Um, those help with driving enthusiasm, with uh, making sure that you know you have that repetitive theme of I'm I'm making uh, things better. Um, and, of course, we all know that they will add up to a larger improvement. So could you do $1 million activity or could you do, uh, you know, 100, uh, you know, smaller activities that will add up to that? Um, so that's really what you're after. Well, you know, the, the other thing is the, the, the big ones are higher risk, aren't they? Yeah, they are. It's that, you know, they often require more resources, more capital, more people, more time, and they are, by nature, then more risky, you know. Um, you might get a bigger reward, but, you know, you might not, you know, so your percentage of win might be very low, whereas the small, very frequent uh, improvements, you know, they generally don't cost as much, they're easier to implement, so you get them done, you get more, you know, and each improvement that you make frees up more time and money that you can make more improvements with. You know, as you're waiting for that big activity to come, you, you tie up everything just working on that activity. That creates that you know and, uh, culture where it embeds the improvement into your uh, corporate culture. You know it becomes part of the way we do business. It's the you know you want that kind of mantra 
uh, of doing things. Um, if you if you got that bigger uh, you know goal of getting you know X amount of dollars, are you going to do it with one project or are you going to do it with many small projects? Yeah, I'm going to plug I'm going to plug Tim's website here. I'm going to interrupt a little bit on this. You know, Tim's got this great flow of. Uh, you know, my my blog and my website, I, I have much more peaks and valleys. You know, I do things a little differently than he does, but he's got a very consistent. You know, he's very methodical about how he he um, puts his stuff up on the on the website, and and one of the things he has up there is a video that shows a manager. I don't remember which one it is, but it's um you know which company it is, but the manager goes around every morning and asks people, everybody in his company. It's a fairly small company, and the president does this and asks what projects they're working on. He writes them down. He checks on it the next day. And everybody's required to do one change a day. Do you remember that one, Tim? Yeah. It's a fast cap. It's a, we started from a small idea and it's grown to a large uh, company making hundreds of products you know, for customers. But it, it started with that small incremental, make it so you know minute that you're able to do it. It'd take 10 minutes, make one improvement. I think they call it two-minute improvement, actually. But it's that idea of making it so small, so easy to do that you really have no choice but to just do it. And you do that every day with every single employee and you've got thousands of ideas. You know, that's really how Toyota does it. When they say they implement, you know, millions and millions of ideas, it's because every person is doing three or four ideas a day. You know, and that's really how you get that. And the only way you're going to be able to sustain something like that is alluding to what Jeff discovered is continually recognizing those small incremental improvements, not just the big activities. You're going to have those occasional big activities you're going to do, but making it more habitual as part of the job. Um, you know, I come to work, I'm going to do this, you know, line set up, but I'm also going to look at how I can improve that, you know, make that part of your everyday job. Well, well, the other big part, this goes back to what you said about developing people. And the actual projects you put people on develops them. So not only do you get gains, but if you have one big project, you might have, you know, it might touch a dozen or more people who are working on this project. And they are the ones who get all the benefit of learning continuous improvement methodologies and, you know, learning all the different tools and kind of seeing how things fit together and working on flow. And the rest of the organization is not as deeply involved. But when you have these small, you know, very pervasive improvements everywhere, everybody in the organization has to learn how to make changes, how to problem solve and all that. And that's the real power of these small wins is that your whole organization is learning and then the big wins start following. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Well put. I mean, it's like creating an everyday process. Now, another thing is that this whole idea of developing people and giving them skills and expecting them to do projects to make small wins, you've got to give them the talent to do that. You've got to give them the skills. And one of the things that I'm always surprised at is how few books people buy for their teams. And if, if a person on your team shows even a slightest bit of interest, go out and get them the books. And, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, the old archives. I'm talking about books that actually have value. And what you're really doing is you're not just, you know, you're not just giving them something. You're thinking of the value of the information versus the cost of a book. And, you know, if you buy a book that's 10 or $15 and give it to a person to take home, and if they read it sporadically over the next two years and pick up one or two pieces of information they put into use on the job, doesn't it pay for the book? I mean, if you think about if they can take one small fact from the book and make one small change that saves 10 bucks a year forever, you know, what's the ROI on, you know, return on the investment of that $20 book if you can save, you know, 10 or $20 a year for the life of the company? And that's what you got to be thinking about with these books. And it also really shows people that you you know you you care, and it's not just books. It's you know if you have if you put it together a library, and I did this in the last webinar about building a library, and you know I always have to put at least one plug in, in these webinars, but uh, you know it's my book there, and I, I recommend buying that one. But it's really about any book you uh, you you buy. If a person is interested and shows interest, feed that interest. You know you can even keep a stack of books if you're a manager. Keep a stack of books in your office. To just hand out and you know put a Kanban on it. So you know, lean thinking, my book. Uh, you know, there's a couple on value stream mapping. You know, the the learning to see book on flow. A three problem solving. If you just keep one of these books in your office, and when somebody shows an interest in problem solving, you throw them in the A three book. When somebody shows an interest in a value stream map, you give them that book. And what you do is you just feed that fire right in that moment. So 
So get people books, get them the opportunities to learn. Don't just give them an expectation. Yeah, I think no. There's, there's no better way to show value in a person than being able to, to give them knowledge that they can use for a lifetime, you know. And that's the, you know, the nice thing about the book is it's a relatively inexpensive means and it can be recycled and reused to lots of people. So I mean, creating that library is by far one of the best investments you can make. Um, and it's easy. You can do book learnings as a team, you know. Mm -hmm. At lunch meeting, you know, get the reward and the training all done at the same time. So there's a lot of things you can do um, by showing that uh, and creating that value in somebody. Yep. Um, the goal is another great one to give people. And you know, I know uh, Goldratt passed away recently, but uh, you know, his book really lives on, and, and all his messages in there. And it's a great book for uh, kind of showing that power. It's a novel format, and there's also a uh, the gold mines, another kind of novel book, you know, novel format book that people can really get into. Um, so it doesn't even have to be a book that's just a technical book in nature. You can buy books that are a little bit more fun to read too. So just get people books, get them reading about lean. And um, I recommend keeping a couple of them on hand. Like I said, you know, the little Kanban system where you replace the book when it's sold, you know, once you give it away. But don't be stingy with the books. The amount you spend on it is, is minimal compared to the value you get from giving books away to your team. So this is a, you know, a topic we've covered before too. I think we live in this uh, culture in which um, we reward firefighting. You know, there's always that manager who gets pat on the back for you know expediting something in, solving somebody's problem, uh, whether it's customer or, you know, and really what we're doing is rewarding that firefighting culture and it. Uh, Really, when we're talking about lean, we want to try to break that down. We want to eliminate those things. Uh, the fires, you know, you kind of the analogy for the problems we have, and you know, we have two solutions to that: either be fire prevention people or fire, uh, you know, uh, fighters at the end. And of course, we want to move from firefighting to fire prevention. So, what are some of the things that you might be able to do in order to uh, change that methodology? You know, obviously, don't recognize, don't reward just the firefighters. Um, you know, maybe maybe you don't do the pat on the back. You do a good job. Say, well, what can we do next time to prevent that from occurring so we're not in that situation again? And if you do more about recognizing the prevention part, then the firefighting will stop on its own. Uh, look at your root cause, a corrective action process. You know, what are you doing to capture uh, you know, the, the preventative measures in your system? A lot of companies who are uh, quality uh, systems uh, certified under some ISO registration possibly. That, that, that's really what they're looking for. What are the preventative measures that the company is taking? Uh, and are you getting to the root cause? And are those uh, changes that you put in place, are they effective? So you have to follow, work on the follow-up to ensure that those are occurring. Can you share those lessons that are being uh, you know, sought after in your company so that you, uh, you know, as you make an improvement in one area, do you share that knowledge so that other areas can then benefit by that improvement and not making uh, necessarily the same learning curve that you might have made in the same area? And of course, we're all going to learn from our mistakes. Use those mistakes as opportunities for our future improvements and create standard uh, practices around those. So if you can kind of embed these a um, uh, couple of bullets in your philosophy uh, you'll change from being firefighters and really good at uh, you know getting the flare-ups and looking at how do you prevent firefighting uh, all along. Yeah, it's just, this is one of those things that it saps resources. And when I go through and do lean assessments, one of the things I do is I kind of talk to managers about how do they spend their time and how do they want to spend their time. And invariably, the one with the biggest mismatch is firefighting. You know, people spend way more time firefighting than they want to. So there's a recognition that the firefighting is bad, but there's not an understanding of how to do it. And that's really where, like what Tim is saying here is, you know, figure out what these fires are and start mistake-proofing and getting rid of those and, and developing the standard work. And use your fires as an opportunity to start tracking that and making those improvements. Yeah, I don't think people realize the uh, time lost in that kind of exercise, um, and there really isn't any learning that's being done when you do that. But certainly working on mistake proofing and standard practice, doing the follow-ups, there's much more to do uh, to gain by following those techniques. Yep. 
And and a part of that is this whole idea of measuring. You know, the firefighting, like I talked about, is tracking. But one of the things about that is is measuring. There's an old uh, carpenter's adage that says, measure twice, cut once, measure twice, cut once. And I kind of like that one. And it's really, you know, measure twice, improve once. What I'm talking about is you're tracking the KPIs or some kind of policy deployment metric that you're using, but you're tracking the basic measurement. And when you get off track, you measure again and figure out the root causes. So you don't act until you have some data to, to develop from that. But, you know, you're really measuring twice, right? You're measuring the first time as you're tracking the ongoing metrics. And if you're not measuring in the first place, you know, you really can't have something wrong unless you know what that normal condition is. So I, you know, I really recommend getting metrics in place, getting KPIs, and it's key performance indicator if you're not familiar with the term. And I actually recommend getting a board up on the wall like this. So if you have a work area, especially one with multiple people doing similar or related jobs, you put this up there, you have uh, the quality. Do you have these up in your work area, Tim? Yeah, we have uh, boards uh, throughout the facility, both at a high level and then uh, at low levels, at a cellular level, for, for instance. Yeah, this is this is one of those ones that if you don't have them up already, it's a it's a big leap to go from having nothing to having a metric posted up on the wall, and you know people sometimes have this you know big brotheritis. They feel like somebody's watching them, looking over their shoulders. Everything's being measured, but the fact is, is everything's being measured whether it's posted or not, right? You know, you're being tracked, you're being monitored in your job, whether you have something visible up on the wall. Now, the thing about having visible on the wall is that you know how you're being measured now. And, you know, in some ways, even if people don't see it, it's a lot more fair for the frontline employee because now they know how they're being tracked and they know how the manager perceives the organization is doing. And when I say they, I'm talking about the collective they. You know, it's, I don't recommend using this for individual performance, but I do think, you know, people put a lot of faith in how the team is doing. They put a lot of, you know, a lot of their satisfaction is not just based on individual performance, but, you know, how is the team perceived in the work area? How is, um, you know, is the team looked at positively? Are they looked at as somebody that's holding up flow and being a barrier? So the KPI board really helps with that. So it helps with creating that um, sense of accomplishment and that, you know, sense of fairness. And it's kind of acts like a contract between managers and employees, but it also acts as this, this um, spur for continuous improvement. And what you see in this here is that little, uh, you know, I don't know if the, the mouse, can you see the mouse, Tim? Yep. Okay, so the mouse, this one right here is a countermeasure sheet. So anytime you have a miss and you're below the line, like right over here, and you have a, you put a countermeasure up, and this is that, that measure the second time. So, you know, you, you do all the stuff, the data collection, and you put it together. But, you know, the measuring is a critical part of it. And if you're not measuring, you're not improving. Yeah, I think this is one of those areas that we could uh, elaborate on in a future, uh, you know, discussion topic. Um, so this is this is really critical for companies to un understand well. Um, too many metrics, too few metrics, the right metrics, how do you post them, where do you post them. There's a lot of that can be done there, but certainly you have to come up with some measurement criteria. Um, and of course, we could go in, in detail in the future about uh, maybe some of the best ones that we've looked at. Yeah, I'm, sit I'm sitting here smiling at this because it, you know it's true. One, if you measure the wrong things, you drive the wrong behavior. And if you don't use the measurements, you create a sense of dissatisfaction. You know, nobody likes to be measured and then not see the results of that measurement. So, you know, this is one that you could do wrong very easily. So most things in continuous improvement, if you make a mistake, you just, you know, you just try it again. But this one here is one, if you make, it, if you make a mistake, you have a lot of, uh, you, you push yourself pretty far backward. So it's probably a good idea to do this as a future one. So, you know, I kind of put in, uh, you know, mapping your value stream. I think this is a common approach that, you know, certainly everybody does. And I kind of put this in here in particular because, you know, when I talk about supercharging your journey, I'm not sure that the people who uh, may be further along in their journey, uh, how often do they go back and look at this and reevaluate those uh, value streams? You know, when you're starting out, it's a very common approach, you know, to kind of, understand your process, you map out the conditions, you look at what we call the three reels or the actuals, and um, you try to understand where you are today, you look at what kind of improvements you can make, you know, we look at the actual place, the actual number of employees and the location and what they're working on, and then the actual process in that location. Um, 
and, and you kind of map those out and you come up with your, you know, improvement opportunities. Um, but then what do you do with that? You know, maybe you implement some of those. What's your frequency to come back and look at those? Um, and we certainly know that, uh, you know, it's kind of three value stream maps a lot of people will use. It's the, um, you know, current state, future state, and then maybe some interim map where, you you know, that's where you're going to get to in the next one to two or three years. And, you know, your future state is really out there. And so that's a kind of what my comment is about, you know, the target is not necessarily the same as the target condition. There is a difference there. And we want to constantly be looking at improving our process to that ideal or what we refer to as true north condition. Um, so it's really important that you go back and reevaluate your value streams, not just at the beginning of your lean journey, but throughout your lean journey and ensure that you're closing that gap to your target all the time. And, and one thing you know I would reiterate is just to be able to, you know, tie this into going out to the gimbal and you create your map, use the actual people that are in the process, go out to the actual place in which it's performed, and collect that first-hand information tour from end to end your value stream, and look at the flow both of the material and the information, um, and you'll be able to do a much better job of understanding what the customer value is. Absolutely. I, I can't stress enough how important a value stream map is. And it's really easy to do for products. It's a lot harder to do when you're talking about services or even internal administrative processes. You know, if you're talking about the hiring process or, um, you know, uh, handling POs or even the improvement process, you know, the, the flow from idea to implemented improvement. There's All these things are value streams based on, you know, what your internal customer supplier relationship is. So don't just limit yourself to thinking it has to be product face, product facing, or you know customer facing or product oriented. There's a lot of value streams throughout your company, and some aren't all that big, but there's still things that cross a couple of functional boundaries. And what you're trying to do is take those functional barriers down and turn them into the steady flow. And you know Tim and I will say flow a lot when we're talking. It's probably one of our more common words. Flow and waste are the two ones that we probably say the most often. But uh, you know really think about how do things flow? And anytime you're talking flow, think about how you can map your value stream. And this might be another good one for the future for, uh, you know, talking a little bit more about value stream mapping in non-traditional types of uh, situations. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of, uh, I'm sure we have a lot of tips that we can give uh, followers. Yeah. And uh, this is uh, my last tip here. Lean is a four-letter word. And I, I say that kind of in jest, but you know everybody on this phone call right now is probably very positive about lean. You know they think about lean, they think about continuous improvement, and they have a good feeling about it. You typically don't have people sign up for webinars like this that are anti-improvement or that they think that there's you know the something bad about it. But when you go into your organization, you're going to have a bell curve. You're going to have that normal distribution of people, and to some people lean is not a good thing it's something that is bad for them because they don't understand it or because it's been misapplied and there's some statistics that are out there that says something like um, 70 percent of companies try some form of lean and 74 percent of those fall short of their expectations so there's a lot of opportunity that somebody has experienced a poor implementation and um, you know Mark Graben has a, a term he says lame lean is misguidedly executed and you know, there's a lot of that that goes around there. But lean is a four-letter word for some people, and you really have to account for that when you're when you're pushing an agenda, when you have this continuous improvement um, philosophy or culture that you're trying to build. You're not going to build it with people who are opposed to it. And, and a couple things happen. You know, one is you push and push and push, and somebody pushes back, and you waste a lot of resources and you don't make progress, and you're, you're in that 74% that doesn't reach their, their end. Or you have people who self-select and they leave the organization, and you know, in some cases that's good for the organization if it's a few people that are really um, highly vocal in resistance and, and, and kind of the, the people who are dragging the others around them down. But when people who are you know, highly skilled and smart, intelligent, 
motivated people are leaving because they don't get lean and they don't understand what you're trying to accomplish and it's misguidedly um, being applied to them, that's a problem. So you really have to focus on this and understand what is lean doing for the individuals, that, that whole WIFM principle, the what's in it for me. And if you don't take that into account and, you, and you're always focusing on the company side of the benefits of lean, it's, um, it's not going to help people. It's not going to get them involved. And, and an, an example would be when you're talking about productivity. You know, productivity isn't something that really matters much to a, the typical employee. And they're going to work eight hours whether they're productive or not productive. And now, again, there's intrinsic motivation. Some people want to get a lot more done. People like being successful. But in the scheme of things, you know, a, a lot of people, they want to put in a hard day's work, and they feel good about the hard day's work. And if they, um, if they feel like that extra 10% productivity doesn't translate to something better in their job, they're not as committed to it as, as a manager might be. And you got to make sure that when you're talking about the productivity gains, you're talking more about the things in perspective of the employee. So you're talking about how do you reduce the frustrations of having to go and go back to your coworkers and ask them for something again and hurt those relationships. You're talking about how do you have them have good interactions on the phone with customers or how do you have them not searching for parts or tools or the frustrations that go along with it? Because those are all the things that people really appreciate. They appreciate that much more than feeling like they got an extra, you know, two units out at the end of the day. So what do you think, Tim? I think the, the easiest way to kind of prevent that from occurring is to make lean relatable to their job function. You know, everybody has specific roles in a company, and sometimes those that make the direct product or service are easier to see than, than others, but I think when we fail in the implementation is when we can't, don't make it relatable. We don't do the what's in it for me, how does it make your job easier, if your job is easier, how does it make your life easier. How do you make it relatable to the, the product or service I do and my job function? And I think if you can solve that, then people will be uh, much more um, on board because they're less afraid of this intangible uh, concept. Yeah, you know, really focus on how you make that uh, part of uh, what they do for the company. Yeah, you know, I have this um, philosophical debate. Every once in a while, I'll get onto somebody else's website, and then I'll have some, you know, back and forth in, in the comment section of a blog article and something like that. And you know, there's one of the big questions that goes around right now is whether money is a good incentive or not. And, you know, I have different views than other people on it. But the fact is, is that people do everything for a reason. You know, if, if you don't believe money is an incentive for people, don't pay them and see if they'll still show up for work. You know, it, it's a big incentive to get people to come to work every day. Um, but that's, you know, that's the core incentive. But there's a lot of other things. And this goes back to the little ones I talked about earlier. But it just comes down to really understanding, knowing the people. And this is really the culmination of all the other ones. When you talk about, you know, developing your team, if people see lean as a way of getting extra skills that makes them more valuable and gives them more um, opportunities, you know, if, if, if a person thinks, I'm going to learn better problem solving, which is going to make me get a raise or promotion or, you know, accomplish more or get a better job down the road, if they see um, that they're being valued and given books, if they see that there's a, a reasonable expectation of workload, all these things start coming out and that negative feeling that people can get about lean. Not everybody has it, of course, but some people do, and they're vocal about it. But the more you drive the positive aspects based on the employee's perspective, the better your uh, your lean operation is going to be. Yeah, I mean, I think you got to make it uh, your own, and you got to, you know, have some positive attitude about it. Yep. And speaking of positive attitude, I'm going to give a bonus tip right now. And the bonus tip is that quarter inch steel doesn't make good shelving. I'm going to tell you a story about this, and I, I learned this firsthand. So when I was, um, I left the army, and in the army, everything is thick. You know, every piece of metal you have in the army is designed to, you know, go off road. And so on, on the Humvees, it's really heavy gauge. You know, you have everything's beefy. And I was on tanks, so you know, you talk about serious, serious steel on tanks. And I went down to uh, a company, and I, I got in a Kaizen, you know, a month in, but I. Uh, you know, I hadn't done engineering for a while. I'd been out of the that area for a little bit. And I was decided I was going to build a shelf to hold these heavy components on. So the components are about 40 pounds each. And I wanted to make a rotating 
shelf that you could restock in the back. Um, you know, it's, it's flow, so you had parts being delivered just in time. And I want to be able to restock the back of this and rotate the cart around so you would expose the open area to the, to the back and it would just be a spinning cart. It would be holding, you know, up to 400 pounds of, of goods on it. So I decided it had to be really, really heavy and to be able to hold it. And I made it tall because there wasn't a lot of space, so I had a, you know, a, a vertical shelf. And at the time, it seemed like a good idea. Um, you know, I hadn't thought about the leaning down and bending over for the bottom or reaching for the top. You know, it was, it was my first time out. So uh, basically what I did is I built this really heavy, seriously top-heavy shelf that people started calling the Tower of Death. And it was probably heavier than the components that it was going to be holding. And, you know, I learned a very important lesson there. And I learned nothing at all about building um, a shelf. I did take a few things out of that. But the biggest thing I learned is I learned to laugh at myself a little bit. I made a, a serious mistake on there. It was fairly costly in terms of the money I spent on it. But I learned a lot about how to, how to go about solving problems a little bit better and, and that sort of thing. But the biggest thing I learned is that, you know, if you, if you get – Take yourself too seriously. It can it can be a really hard time on Kaizen's because you will make mistake you know, mistakes. Anytime you're trying to do improvements, you're not going to bat a thousand, especially if you're pushing yourself a little bit. And if you take yourself seriously, you're going to have a rough time of it because you will make a lot of mistakes. You will have a lot of barriers. So you laugh about them. You laugh them off. You laugh at yourself, and you have a good time doing it. So the fact is, you spend a lot of your waking hours at work, driving to work, getting ready for work, thinking about work at home. Um, and if you're not having fun at doing that, you're making a big mistake in your career. So, Tim, any last thoughts? No, I agree. I mean, I think you get a lot more with, uh, you know, that kind of approach to uh, life in general. Uh, certainly at work uh, as well. But, uh, you know, you know, try your best. And, you know, it's like the Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts always say, you know, try to do your best and, and you know, learn from your mistakes. And so I think if you have that great positive attitude, you're going to go much further. And, uh, Learn to, you know, look in the mirror and kind of have a chuckle. Yep. So here's just a quick synopsis. Remember, go to Gemba, watch and listen to what people really say, and, and develop your people. Look for those tiny rewards to keep people motivated continuously in a series of small wins. Get people the books that they need to be successful and uh, use that information to really stamp out the fires, but also take away the fuel source, you know, take away the, the reasons for those fires so you don't have to do any more. Measure both in terms of tracking performance and measure for making the improvements. And you're measuring based on this value stream that you have for each of your operations, not just the products and services. And finally, you know, lean's a four-letter word to some people. Make sure that you're not just pitching it, um, you know, because it's lean, pitch the value that people get out of it, the personal value, not the value for the company. And with that said, Tim, why don't you talk about our uh, information gathering? Sure. Um, you know, we've been doing the webinars for a number of uh, months, uh, almost a year, I think, now. But Getting uh, close. One of the things that we're talking about is uh, how do we make this uh, useful and valuable to uh, our listeners. And uh, so if you have ideas on topics that you'd like to hear specifically, you know, we'd love to, um, to hear about that. You, know, you can certainly uh, send us a note in the uh, chat here. Um, if you've got topic ideas, or you'll see our contact information at the end. But you know, along with that, you know, is this your first webinar? You know, we'd like to understand have you been to our other webinars and which ones have you enjoyed or not? And, and do you share that information with other people in your organization, friends, colleagues? You know, do, you, do you tell them about these webinars, share that information? How do you use that maybe in your organization to make improvement? Um, so those are kind of some things that we're talking about. Uh, or really just give us some feedback. You know, we're here as a resource uh, to give you some advice that we've learned along the way that's been shared with us or that we've developed on our own. And uh, so we'd certainly like to uh, help solve your problems if, uh, if we can. And if you give us the feedback, we'd be more than happy to do that. In, in, in essence, what we're doing here is a little bit of value, a voice of the customer. We're trying to do a little bit of, of data collection here just to start seeing which questions to ask. And, and the goal here is really to understand, um, is what we're doing here value added to you? Does this give you something that makes you, um, you know, that helps you in your job on any of these, any of these uh, programs we've been putting together? And just to hear back from you and understand that a little bit more. So some follow-up information. Um, Tim has quite a bit out there right now. One of my favorite things that Tim does is on his Facebook page, 
he gives a, a very quick tip of the day, and it's just a little something you can use and try to put in place. If you're not already subscribed to him on, on his Facebook account, um, I, I recommend following it. it. It is a good, quick burst to lean every morning to get you going. I have a, a different, like a different style, like I said. You know, he does more of the steady flow. I do more of the, you know, bigger things, but less frequently. And one of the things I just put up, I just put up a, a policy deployment matrix that you can use to help uh, cascade your top-level strategies down to actionable items, uh, you know, pri improvement priorities and, and targets that you can quantify. So um, take a look at my website for those. Take a look at Tim's website for his, um, you know, to, to find out how to get to link to uh, his Facebook page. And his is a leanjourney.com. Mine, you can go got to go lean, and it'll take you to the uh, the uh, blog part of it. Or valaction.com is is the kind of umbrella website. And uh, this website any... is a great uh, resource. You know, uh, I'm a firm believer in not reinventing the wheel, and so there's a lot of uh, uh, documentation already available for you to uh, subscribe to. But you can also uh, get a copy of uh, the lean uh, index that he's created. It's a glossary of terms, and, and it goes much more in detail to uh, terminology and how you use that. So those are all resources that are available there for you, so you don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, this is just actually for the recording here. Um, we will be posting these slides out in case you want to use it and go over them with your own organization. We'll be putting the slides up, and we'll also be putting the recording of this presentation up. So you can use both of those things to help with your organization. Um, we did get one comment here from, from Beatrice saying, it is the first time I attended your webinar. So it, it's interesting. You know, we do have some people coming for the first time. Um, any questions about the content that we gave out today, or just a general lean question? We have, you know, eight more minutes left on the clock here, and, uh, you know, kind of running the time out until the end of it. If there's any questions, we will be happy to stick around and ask, and it doesn't have to be related to what we talked about today. Any questions you have, we're willing to answer for uh, now seven more minutes. Um, but if we don't have any questions, we'll go ahead and, and end the, the webinar now. So any questions? Any ideas? Well, Jeff's, well, Jeff's looking at the questions. You know, we list those ten things together, and it's not by uh, surprise that uh, a lot of those are synergistic. Um, they, they do complement each other, and that's kind of why they work together so well. So do you have to do all 10 tips to, you know, make your uh, journey successful? Probably not. But, you know, certainly a number of them go hand in hand together, and you should really consider implementing those uh, together in tandem or, or multiples. Uh, but certainly this advice can certainly help. It's helped us, and so we hope that you got something out of that today. Okay, Tim, here's a question for you. I'm, I'm going to give you uh, seven minutes. See if you can answer this question in seven minutes. How do you create a value stream map on a complex company with over 60 operations, 5,000-plus suppliers, and custom-based orders? Well, I mean, you know, there are a couple good resources out there for creating extensive value streams. But, I mean, really what you got to start to look at is, you know, pick a uh, a whole uh, do some sort of product matrix versus process matrix, and you want to carve out a product family, for instance, um, because what you'll find is there is a lot of repetition in the processes. Um, when you look at it like in a job shop or multiple business units, you don't often see that, um, but there is a lot of similarities. And so if you list the product types and then the attributes or process attributes, then you'll find the commonality between that, you pick that product family, and that's where I would start. Um, and then the ones that you know you think are important after that, you can kind of value stream. But that'll get you, you know, that's an eighty twenty rule, right? It gets you most of the way to the improvement, and um, you know, it's a good place to start. If you're, you know, complexity in a business is a whole different subject we could talk about. But certainly, if you're entertaining uh, complexity along you know, with your business um, by different skews, different parts, different, you know. You, there's some sort of uh, inefficiency associated with that, and you really have to consider those options too. But it's kind of a more in-depth uh, subject um, that we could go into detail on. Yeah, the, the two parts that jump out to me is, is like, you know, I was going to go for the complexity. You know, one is, like you said, you know, the PQPR, parts quantity, process routing, and there's, there's actually, you know, forms and things that you can use to help with that tool. Um, but, you know, the complexity of it, 
you're trying to strip out the complexity with the value strip map and look at it from you know the thirty thousand foot. So think of it like you're flying over a, a neighbor, you know, a city. You don't actually see individual houses, so you're not really looking so much at the individual suppliers on a value strip map. You're really looking at you know the probably like the backbone product. When you so when you're looking at the suppliers, think in terms of you know the the when you start placing the orders for you know the the big framework piece. So if it's a circuit board or you know if it's the frame for an automobile or whatever it is, you know you kind of think in terms of that. So you're not really looking at how to attract 5,000 suppliers on a value stream map. You're looking at the bit, the major flow. Um, in terms of the you know the piles, you're looking at for where the work and process is sitting, not so much the individual raw materials. And you'll you'll get to that in a different methodology. But you're looking for how long it takes from the time the longest product, you know, the backbone product comes in from the supplier until it gets out to the customer. Now in the custom-based orders, one of the nice things about a value stream map is you can include the information. So at some point your your custom your order becomes customized. And whether that's when you first place the order for the raw materials, if that's where the customization comes in, or if somewhere in the middle of your process it turns from a generic product to a customized product. And these are all things that you can kind of show how the flow goes. So this is exactly what the value stream map is for, is to show how that information and the, and the flow interacts. Now I do recommend, if you haven't done a lot of these for complex value stream maps before you find a mentor, um, there's probably like a lean network in your neighborhood somewhere that you can actually find somebody who'd be willing to come in. Um, you know, you can always go for consultants. And I, you know, for me, I, I like that route because I'm a consultant. But, you know, most of my business is not consulting. It's uh you know the the product and services and sales. So I feel comfortable saying try a uh, to find a local mentor first, somebody who can help you out. Um, I do have one more question here. How can you engage employees if there's no reward at the beginning of the implementation? So uh, so Chad said thanks. This is from Carla. So how do you uh, engage employees if there's no reward at the beginning of the implementation? Well, I think you have to be creative in how you find the rewards. I think um, you know you may not have a big budget, but you know, I, I've seen managers who go and grab a bag of ice cream bars on a hot day and, and bring those out and hand them out when, when teams are doing really well. So, you know, the, the, and then like Tim talked about the personal recognition, but the reward often is from making the small improvements. So when you're, when you're looking at your first projects, let your employees pick the first projects. You know, it might not be the thing that's best for the company in terms of profitability, but if you can get an engaged team, you're building that foundation. So always think about how can you lay another brick onto the, the, the fundamental foundation of your culture, and if you can do something that will reduce the frustration, even if it's not a big dollar item for your company, you, you get one step closer to where people are going to recognize why the bigger projects are helpful. And this could be something where, you know, you have a minor um, glitch in a system that makes um, order entry teams get yelled at by customers on the phone. And if you can get rid of that, you can you can really make some big progress. Um, Tim, what do you think? Again, the question is, how can you engage employees if there's no reward at the beginning of the implementation? Yeah, I mean, brute force is always a tough way to go. But I mean, I think there's a, there are rewards you can give that don't cost any money, and we've covered a little bit of those today. But, you know, it's recognizing people, it's encouraging them to take part and make their job easier. A lot of people do associate productivity. That's why they, uh, a number of people will inherently make improvements on their own. Uh, you want to tap into those resources, you know. Um, and it's a subject we can go into, but I think, you know, certainly there are things you can do that cost no money. You have to encourage them to solve problems, uh, and you have to make them understand why that's better for the organization. I also, uh, I'll make the same recommendation I made to Chad earlier. Um, try and find an organization that's a little bit further ahead of you locally and see if you can get a tour of their area and go talk to somebody who's doing it there. So, you know, when you're a trainer, one of the things I learned early on in my, in my lean career is to be a trainer, you don't have to know everything. You just have to know a little bit more than the people you're training and try and get them closer to where you are. So, you know, the more knowledge you have, it, it's helpful in, in general but the fact is, is you can't give all of your knowledge and everything to a person all at once. So find somebody who's just a little bit further ahead of you, go to them, you know, and 
and see how they've made the steps that you want to make now. How have they engaged their employees? What have they done to get people more um, involved? Um, does that help, Carla? Okay, good. So you said yes. I think sometimes you in these webinars, you know, you you don't exactly get the right question. You give some good information, but specifically, I'd say go find somebody to benchmark that's a little bit further ahead of you. Look for the small rewards that you can give, and focus on um, the frustrations people have early on, and let them see how the tools can actually get them um, their own problem solved, and that becomes a reward for them in itself. So with that, I think we are out of time, and I'll, I'll stay a couple minutes longer if there's any other questions. Anyone else? Okay, looks like there's no other questions popping up. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.